Hi, welcome back to the Banqueting Table. I'm your host, Diana Green, and it's a pleasure to be with you today. Listen, we are working on a Bible study series called Tablespoons of Revival. And if you don't know what that is, just go back in my channel and you'll see the previous uh, sessions that we've done. And you can catch up to today. But I will tell you this, so far we have covered Lesson 1, Revival, Who Needs It? Lesson 2, Humility, Coming to God on His Terms. Lesson 3, Honesty, Silence is Not Always Golden. Lesson 4, Repentance, The Big Turnaround. And Lesson 5, Grace, God's Provision for Every Need. And that's the lesson that we are still on, is grace God's provision for every need so as I said you can go back to the other uh, videos and catch up on what was said and what was taught during those uh, lessons but I want to begin with a pledge of allegiance yep the pledge of allegiance so put your hand on your heart and you won't be able to say this after me but you can just agree and this is the pledge I pledge allegiance to the Lord with a united undivided heart and to the gospel on which I stand one member of his body with liberty in the spirit for all amen well today as I said we're still continuing with the topic of grace and I said the last time we were together Grace is a deep well, and I said my little tablespoon, I probably have pulled up half a teaspoon of understanding <laughs> about grace because it is such a deep topic, but it's something that God is willing to give each and every one of us. So if you'll turn in your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 5, 1 Peter chapter 5, and for those of you who uh, <clears throat> enjoy uh, Monday Manna, which is being transformed and um, transitioned <laughs> into a different uh, platform and format, then you probably heard my sister Danette teaching on 1 Peter chapter 5. And I got to tell you, I heard the message and I was listening to it when she mentioned 1 Peter chapter 5. I was like, oh God, she's going to teach on my lesson. She's going to teach on my lesson. But you know what? It doesn't matter if a million teachers and preachers teach on 1 Peter chapter 5 verses 1 through 11 you're going to get something for your soul out of each and every one of them the word is not constricted I might feel constricted but the word of God is not constricted so turn to 1 Peter chapter 5 and we're going to read verses 1 through 11 and we're talking about grace today God's provision for every need it says I'm reading out of the Amplified Bible and it says therefore I strongly urge the elders among you pastors spiritual leaders of the church as a fellow elder and as an eyewitness called to testify of the sufferings of Christ as well as one who shares in the glory that will be revealed Verse 2, shepherd and guide and protect the flock of God among you. Did you hear that? Shepherd and guide and protect the flock of God among you. Exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God. And not motivated for shameful gain, but with wholehearted enthusiasm. Not lording it over those assigned to your care. Do not be arrogant or overbearing, but be examples of Christian living to the flock. Set a pattern of integrity for your congregation. And when the chief shepherd, Christ, appears, you will receive the conqueror's unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you younger men of lesser rank and experience, be subject to your elders Seek their counsel, and all of you, all of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Tie on the servant's apron. Isn't that cool? Tie on the servant's apron. For God is opposed to the proud, 
the disdainful, the presumptuous, and he defeats them, but he gives grace to the humble. Verse 6, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Set aside self-righteous pride, so that he may exalt you to the place of honor in his service at the appropriate time, casting all your cares, all your anxieties, all your worries, all your concerns, once and for all on him. For he cares about you with deepest affection and watches over you very carefully. Verse 8. Be sober, well-balanced, and self-disciplined. Be alert and cautious at all times. That enemy of yours, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, fiercely hungry, seeking someone to devour. But resist him in faith. Be firm in your faith against his attack, rooted, established, immovable, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being experienced by your brothers and sisters throughout the world. You do not suffer alone. Verse 10. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who imparts his blessing and favor, who called you to his own eternal glory in Christ, will himself complete, confirm, strengthen and establish you making you what you ought to be to him be dominion power authority sovereignty forever and ever amen that's a lot but that's all good and i want to say right here this is an online bible study these are not minute messages these messages and and studies are designed for you to pull up a chair to the banqueting table, grab your notepad or your electronic pad, whatever you use, grab your Bible, get a pen, get a, uh, a pencil, something to write with. I don't care if it's a crayon and you, and you doodle and you draw and that's how you understand the scriptures and they come to life for you. If you're a graphic artist, it doesn't matter, but get something to engage yourself with the Word of God. And Bible studies are not designed, I'm just going to say this, Bible studies are not designed for you to quickly eat, you're at the banqueting table, gouge down your food, gobble up your food, and get up from the table. Bible studies are designed for you to come to the table with the Lord, with your Bible study tools, with the Holy Spirit, with an open heart, with an open mind, and receive and take in and understand and enjoy and think about and question what you're studying. And the Holy Spirit will bring revelation. You know, the scripture says in the book of Psalms, that the entrance of the word is light. He said, your word is light. It enters me. It gives me understanding. If I'm simple-minded, it helps me be wise. So the entrance of the word is light. So that we don't walk in darkness. Okay, so it, it, especially today, if you don't really know what direction you're going, where you're going, start taking in, taking in, taking in the Word of God. Just read it and let it come into you because it's light. Okay, so don't be in a hurry to get up from the table and run on to your next thing. Here, let me just say this also. I know we live in a microwave world. We want everything like that. Just like that. You mean it took me two minutes to warm up a sandwich? Yeah. That's the world we live in. But that's not the world that God lives in. That's not the world the Holy Spirit lives in. That's not the way the kingdom of God operates. It's not on the earth's time zone. It's on kingdom time zone. And it takes kingdom time to absorb kingdom things. I hope you got that. Okay, so let's continue. I want to just go over a little bit some of the things that Peter was doing and then we'll get into the grace subject. <clears throat> because Peter had to, for one thing, he was strongly urging the elders to do these things, to lead. He was strongly urging them to 
um, lead the flock of God properly. But he began by saying, I'm one of you. I understand you, understand what you go through, I understand the difficulties that you're having. He said, I'm an elder, and he said, as a matter of fact, I was there the whole time walking with Jesus. Even in his failure, when he denied Jesus, he was still connected to Jesus. And Jesus reestablished him, <laughs> amen, in his calling because he repented. And so he reestablished Peter to be able to go and carry out the ministry that he had given him. But he said, I was there. I saw his sufferings. I, I heard everything he said. I watched everything that God did through him. And so I know. So he was talking about having been a part of the first tribe, if you will, <laughs> the first apostles who followed Jesus and learned from him how the kingdom of God operates and then how to teach others how to live in those parameters. You know, boundaries and parameters are very good. They're very safe for us. So he reminded them that um, also what awaits them at the end of their faithful service. He said, there is a crown of glory waiting for you at the end of your faithful service. He reminded them why and how to serve the flock of God. He said two things specifically. Do it willingly and do it by example. He said do it willingly and he was appealing to them. He was begging them and it made me wonder why did he have to beg them to change the way they were doing things? Something to think about. But he said do it willingly, not grudgingly, not for what you'll get out of it, but because you are eager to serve God and not because, listen to this, not because you need a job and you need an income. That's not the reason to serve the flock of God. So he said, do it willingly, out of a pure heart, out of a heart to serve the Lord. That's why you serve the flock of God or the people of God is because you want to serve <clears throat> the Lord. Very different from what the ancient shepherds were doing. And if you go to Ezekiel chapter 34, you'll see what the ancient, ancient shepherds <laughs> were doing um, to the sheep. And so Peter was kind of saying, don't behave that way. And then he said, do it by example. Do it by the example of your love for God, just like Jesus did. Jesus served everywhere he went. He was in servant mode as well as leader mode, but he was in servant mode because he loved the Father. Everything he did and everything he does today, he's alive, seated at the right hand of God because he was raised from the dead and exalted to the right hand of God. And he ever lives to make intercession for you and me. And he's interceding and praying for you and me that our faith doesn't fail because he loves God. So everything he did and everything he does stems from his love for the Father. You know, I want to say this, that we're, we're talking about grace, and it takes grace, favor, enabling, strength, and power of God to care for others in the right way and for the right reason. I'm going to say that again. It takes the grace, the favor, the enabling, strength, and power of God to care for others in the right way and for the right reason. And I must say, I didn't always live and walk in this truth, but praise God for His grace and the power of the Holy Spirit to turn us around, put our feet on solid ground, and move us forward. Amen? And then Peter begins to admonish the younger, the younger, chronologically or spiritually younger. You could be 65 years old and be the younger one in the faith. Amen? But he admonished the younger to submit to the authority of the elders. And, you know, if we're honest and, and we look at that word submission, that is one of the hardest words for human beings to grab a hold of, latch on to, and actually walk out in our daily lives. And here's why. Because we are naturally rebellious. Say, ouch, amen, at a girl, get it, Diana, say that. We're naturally rebellious. If you're honest, you will you will agree with that. We're naturally rebellious because we have a fallen nature. We have a fallen nature. 
and, and maybe we'll talk more about that as time goes on this next year. By the way, Happy New Year. I'm <laughs> looking forward to 2023. Amen. But it's because we have a natural inclination toward rebellion. And I believe this. I believe every sinful decision that you and I make has its root in rebellion toward God. So I believe this is why Peter was reminding the younger to submit to the elder. But then he goes on and covers everybody in the group. And these principles are for you and for me too. He speaks to everyone and said, serve everyone in humility serve one another in humility elders younger alike everyone male female child adult serve everyone in humility no one is exempt from humility and the higher you go and the deeper you dive into God's ways the more you realize how much you need humility in your life the more I see the rebellion in me so he warns against that he warns against refusing to humble ourselves in verse 5 he says God sets himself against the proud aka the rebellious but he shows favor aka grace to the humble so what does grace-filled humility look like? In other words, how do believers and followers of Christ live out grace-filled humility? Well, let's look at some points on that matter today, okay? Uh, grace-filled humility looks like this. And you're going to want to write these scriptures down so you can go and look at them for yourselves and read them and, and maybe even make a little study of them yourself. But grace-filled humility looks like this waiting on God to act. Number one, grace-filled humility looks like waiting on God to act. Psalms 27. Psalms 27. Number two, grace-filled humility looks like giving our cares and our worries to God. That's grace-filled humility and that's what Peter was encouraging the listener to do giving all our cares and worries to God. Matthew chapter 6 verses 31 and 33. Grace-filled humility number 3 is being alert and wise. Neither grace nor humility are passive activities. They are not passive. Humility is not passive. Neither is grace. Our enemy's number one tactic is to cause us to behave like himself instead of our biblical example, who is Jesus. Satan was a rebel in the beginning, and he continues to be a rebel and an enemy of God, and frankly, an enemy of yours. And let me just say this. If you are a friend of Lucifer, or a friend of things outside of the kingdom of God, the other types of gods, in the world and you follow them and you serve them let me just say this to you that enemy that rebel will turn on you if you decide to turn on it try it see what happens if you serve Lucifer start walking away and see what happens see if he'll let you go <laughs> yeah no he won't he's a rebel and a destroyer He's a destroyer of the faith. Luke 22, verses 31 and 34, and Job chapter 6, verses 6 through 9. I hope you're writing these down. Grace-filled humility looks like resisting the devil and being strong in faith. And that's in Matthew chapter 4, and that's point number 4. Resist Grace-filled humility looks like resisting the devil and being strong in faith and I'm looking forward to preaching some messages on resisting. Number five, grace-filled humility looks like remembering that you're not alone. You're not alone. Verse 9b, Peter said the things you're going through, your brothers and sisters all over the world are going through, you are not alone. You need to listen to um, David Kreider's song, um, Hallelujah, We Are Not Alone. God really loves us. David Crowder. I don't even remember what the title is, but I know how it goes. 
and it's either hallelujah we are not alone or we are not alone or god really loves us one of those but that song will minister to you remembering you are not alone is what grace-filled humility looks like number six remember your challenges are temporary that's in verse 10 our challenges are temporary in verse 10 second corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17 and finally the seventh thing about grace-filled humility is remember who is in control remember who is in control you'll find that in verse 11 you'll find that in verse 11 one other thing I want to touch on about grace beautiful thing that the Lord showed me I believe he showed me is that when Peter was warning them about the roaring lion I was reminded of the children of Israel that same roaring lion was chasing the children of Israel as they were approaching the sea of reeds to cross through it to get out of Egypt for good but even though that roaring lion in the uh, the uh, image of Pharaoh and Pharaoh's armies was ravenously chasing after the children of Israel the mighty presence of God was there with his grace <laughs> and his people needed to continue on in faith as they moved through that path that Moses had given them God was there with the power they needed to continue and I just want to tell you God is with you with the power the strength the durability the endurance that you need to continue I know what I'm talking about okay <laughs> I know what I'm talking about but we can just imagine how long that trek was and how tiring it was trying not to stumble over the person in front of you or let or the person behind you walking on your heels you know trying to get through this um, pathway that God had made for them to escape the roaring lion but the great shepherd the one who overcomes the predator who is set on destruction he was there providing the faith that they needed to continue on the lion was on their heels but the God of Israel was then and is now the holy rear guard listen the holy rear guard of his people I need you to see Exodus chapter 14 verses 19 and 20 it says this but you go read it for yourself and the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them and the pillar of cloud from before them and stood behind them the let me see the pillar of cloud moved and stood behind them the angel of the Lord went behind them the pillar of cloud went behind them to be between the children of Israel as they were moving forward and the roaring lion who was behind them this word rear guard God is our rear guard and I want to just remind you and I want to remind me to don't look behind because the rear guard is there but keep moving forward even through something as tough as the Red Sea or the Sea of Reeds really now listen according to the Miriam dictionary one of the uses for the word rear guard speaks of a military detachment it's a detail to bring up and protect the rear of a main body or force now you know all those millions of people moving through that opening that God had made that dry land that he had provided in the midst of the sea you know all of those people were a force and a main body and here it says the rear guard is a military detachment <laughs> detail to bring up and protect the rear of a main body what does that teach me Exodus chapter 14 and first Peter chapter 5 1 through 11 as I yield myself to the grace of God follow his directives and follow his leading it teaches me that if I have a regiment of two that's enough the angel of the Lord and the Holy Spirit of God 
Heaven only needs a detachment of two. Jesus, the captain of the Lord's army, and the spirit of the living God. I'm telling you, this grace thing that God has provided for our every need, the power, the strength, the enablement, oh, the ability to follow his lead, follow his ways, walk in his kingdom, to learn of him, to be transformed into the image of Jesus, and to love God, as my pastor says, from all of our heart, from all of our mind, from all of our soul, from all of our strength. I'm telling you, the grace of God will see you through. Well, that's all I have for the banqueting table today. Again, that's a tablespoon of revival. I really hope you feel revived and encouraged and hopeful in your soul as you continue to seek God for your personal revival. Until we meet again, may God richly bless you and keep you well. Amen.